opening song. It's great to see you guys today. So nine years, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars given to mission, it's over a hundred people baptized here. Many of our folks were not in church before they came, and this is a place to call home. This is a family. It's not a country club. So at a country club, you know, all the members get what they want, and uh, but we're a family, so we lean towards each other, and we have humility with each other. It means that sometimes, uh, you know, for those of you who know me, when I go to Disney World, Lydia wants to ride It's a Small World. I hate It's a Small World. It drives me crazy. It sits in my head for weeks afterwards. It is the most miserable thing I do, and guess what? I go on It's a Small World. Why? Because I love my daughter. And because we love each other, sometimes that means we uh, uh, compromise with each other, not ever compromise God's word, but our preferences. And that's what it means to be a part of a family. And if you're Italian, you're part of a family. And, uh, and we are glad to be that. And I want to say this too. Um, when we first started, I honestly thought, you know, I'll teach school. And, uh, and then we'll have a home Bible study, and we weren't sure how it was going to look. Yet all these years, um, you guys have made sure that we have grown as a church, that we've cared for people, that we've reached out to people. We have buried people together. We have married people together. We have seen children come and grow up in our church. And I'm so excited. You know, coming up in October, we will have a fall festival um, you know, outdoors is, is one of the safest environments you can be in now, and we're learning all of this stuff, and so we're excited to welcome the community and to be able to love on kids in the community and care about them, and you guys do that. You guys do that. We don't have to beg, um, and I refuse to beg. I've always told people, we'll just cancel stuff, but uh, so it's been great over the years, all of you that chip in and do what God's called you to do, and... Um, and so there we are. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited about children's ministry restarting. We're going to see how it goes. Um, we're debating whether we're just going to do one service for children just because uh, it's kind of hard right now to even have kids and then, and then to have adults who want to volunteer, some who uh, can't or refuse to wear masks or for whatever reason can't or won't. And that's okay, too. We love them. And, uh, and um, anyway, but I'm excited. And so thank you for nine years as your pastor. I don't deserve to be your pastor, but I'm grateful that you are willing to compromise and allow me to be your pastor. So thanks for letting me be part of this family. I had a church approach me just a few months ago asking me if I would consider coming to their large church. And I looked at them and said, I will not leave my family to even turn in a resume at this church. But thank you for asking. And, uh, and I said, I don't even like your people. No, I didn't say that. Was... <laughs> so today we're going to talk about humble enough for healing. Now, the problem with doing a chapter at a time, especially in the book of Mark, is that Mark is the Cliff Notes version. And so every time that I have to make these decisions, I'm like, well, I can't do every story. So I would encourage you, read the scripture. That's the reason we're doing a chapter at a time. You can read it. You can study it. You can learn about it. By the way, can I teach you a secret? That's more important than anything I say anyway. You read the Bible for yourself. Let God speak to your heart. My hope is that when I'm teaching, God does that. I'm trying to take, like they said in the Old Testament, I, I take what Scripture says and try to make it where you understand it. That's what it talks about in the Old Testament. Today we're going to talk about three humbling truths for healing. And let me tell you something I know about me and about you. One of the reasons that we don't have healing in certain parts of our lives, whether it's, it, it could be physical healing, and, and that's what we talk about a little bit in here. It could be spiritual healing. It could be emotional he healing. One of the reasons we don't grow up, and one of the reasons there's churches who have people who've been there 50 years who are still baby Christians. I mean, you could be a Christian 50 years and be the most self-centered person around still. Did you know that? Because if you don't humble yourself and allow God through his Holy Spirit to speak to you, then he doesn't force you to change. You, you can be grumpy and mean and self-centered and all those things. Now, after a while, I might wonder if you've really surrendered your life to Christ. And I want you to know what an idiot your pastor is. So I'm going to tell this story. Years ago, uh, about eight years ago, I had to go to the hospital for diverticulitis. I had been in in December for about a week, and that didn't help. And in January, I began running a 103-degree fever. 
So I called my doctor who said, get to the hospital right away. My doctor was in Orlando at that time at ORMC. So I drove to ORMC and he said, check in through the ER. So I went to the ER to check in and I sat there for two hours. After two hours, I went to the person at the desk. I said, here's my cell phone number. I can't stay in here anymore. I've got to lay down. I'm going to go lay down in the lobby. So here I was profusely sweating. I went and laid down in the lobby. By the way, later they found out I was septic, which is not good, by the way. And so I was laid down in the lobby. I can even remember doctors coming through with interns and them stopping and in the little white coats and looking and wondering what I was doing. And here I was just laying on a bench out in front of the hospital or in the lobby there. After another hour or two, I decided, you know what? If I'm not sick enough that they're worried about me, I'm going home. So I got back in the car myself and drove myself home. By the way, just to let you know how stubborn I was, when I had second degree and third degree burns on my foot last year, I drove myself to the hospital, and that's because I'm an idiot. But um, anyway, so I drove myself home. At that point, an administrator from the hospital called me. He said, Mr. Brookins, please come back to the hospital. And I said, well, all right. I didn't think it was serious enough since y'all weren't worried about me. I, I figured out you didn't, I didn't need to be in the hospital if nobody was concerned. And she said, uh, no, no, we're concerned. By that point, I could not drive. And so somebody had to drive me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I could no longer walk. They wheeled me in to the hospital, to my room, to which my doctor showed up and asked me what kind of idiot I was. I was in the hospital for another 30 days. Now, I tell you all that to say this. Part of me to this day, part of me, I'll just be honest with you, thinks I did what was right. I mean, I don't want to bother anybody. I'm just going to, can I tell you what that is? That's pride. We tend to think how we see things is right, where everybody else can look and go, what kind of dummy are you? But we all tend to struggle in areas that we don't see. And let me tell you what we need. And we're going to look at this today. See, see, God through his Holy Spirit gives you a mirror to look in and to not look at other people in the mirror. But to look in the mirror and say, God, what do I need to change? Who do I need to become? In the Old Testament, when they would go into the temple and sacrifice, after they would sacrifice, they would go to a reflective basin to wash off. That was so they could see themselves. That truth is still true. As you wash with God's blood, it's to look in the mirror and say, God, what do I need to change? And we can't get well till we humbly realize our need to change. And the Holy Spirit is the one. That'll give us the mirror. So we're going to look at three things today that all talk about humility. In Mark 10, 43, I think Steve referred to the children. But the whole idea there is that whoever wants to be great will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of it all. This whole chapter is about humility. Everywhere in this chapter is about humbling ourselves. And if you want to be healed... You have to surrender your pride, your arrogance, your self-centeredness to him. So number one, commitment can bring reconciliation. So they come to Jesus as usual. They're trying to trick him. So they're trying to ask him about divorce. There were two different groups that were fighting over whether you could just divorce because you felt like it. You wanted to trade your 40-year-old wife into for 220s. Now... Believe it or not, when I was reading the commentaries, that's really what they wanted to do most of the time at that time when they wanted to give their wife a certificate of divorce. The guys who believed that you could do it freely, they just wanted a younger wife. It had nothing to do with commitment or anything else. And then there was another group who said you can only do that in cases of infidelity. And so Jesus says this, said, what did Moses say to you? They said, Moses for permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And then Jesus says this, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. And then he refers back to Genesis 127. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then he says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. That's from Genesis 224. 
Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. How many of you have heard that in a wedding? You've heard one of those, right? Right? Pastors love that. Why? Because we understand, because we see it all the time, that when people are joined in marriage, when a divorce happens, it rips people apart. And those of you who've been through a divorce know that pain and that hurt. And then Jesus says this, when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. This was another one of those times where the disciples were standing around going, yeah, Jesus, yeah, Jesus, yeah, Jesus. What were you talking about? And so he says to him, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. Now notice Jesus does not blame the one who is innocent. He says, hey, if, if, if they're just kicking you out of the house for no reason, they're just not happy. You know, and in our world, we have a lot of people who say, well, I just want to be happy. But God calls us to commitment. And then it says, if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. And you'll remember early in this chapter, there was one of the leaders who had divorced her husband and married his brother. And that's why John the Baptist was killed. That's what that whole story is about. And it's funny, he refers back to that. Now, here's a couple things I want to say to you in this. First of all, if you've been through a divorce, I want you to know God has forgiveness. And if you were not the cause of divorce, you don't need to feel guilty. If your spouse cheated on you, you, you know, it doesn't mean you don't have things to work on, but you don't need to feel like, well, I'm a second-class citizen in God's kingdom. Too many churches treat people who've been through divorce as second-class citizens. And I would also say, if you are the one who messed up, that God is forgiving and he brings healing. And so I want you to know that, but I want you to know something my mentor years ago said to me, Dave Daniel. He said, Eric, it takes two people to be married, but only one to get divorced. It takes two people, and, and it's about humility. Listen, if you want a better marriage, can I tell you what it looks like? A little humility helps you to bend towards each other. Why do I write It's a Small World? Because one of my children says, I want to write It's a Small World. Why do you do certain things? Listen, if everything in your marriage, if everything in your relationships, if everything in your friendships revolves around you, that's not a true friendship. That's not true love. Now, I'm not encouraging you to stay in an abusive relationship. Please don't. And I, if you need advice about that, I'd love to talk to you. And there's so much more I can talk about that. I've heard pastors say all kind of dumb things about that. Let me just say that. But here's what I would ask you to, the question. What do I need to do to be more loving? What do I need to do to be more like Christ in my relationships? Whether it's marriage, whether it's friendship, whether it's with your children. Instead of always looking at the other person and going, you know, if only they would change, this would be so much better. How about instead we realize you can't change other people. But allow the Holy Spirit to look in your heart and say, what do I need to change to be a better husband? What do I need to change to be a better wife? What do I need to change to be a better grandma? By the way, being a better grandma or grandpa does not mean you give those children everything. I know you want to. And then send them home, right? It's for us to look in the mirror. Now, we skipped the story of Jesus with letting the kids come, but thank you, Steve, for, for mentioning that. And he talked about, he took them in his arms when the disciples were saying they're not necessarily, listen, Jesus values children. Number two, comfort can keep us from Christ. So commitment can bring rec rec reconciliation, and then comfort can keep us from Christ. Now, one of the things that I love is there's a commercial recently that talks about how we think we're good enough. We think we have it together enough. And this is what it would look like in real life. Have you ever worked for Dr. Francis? Oh, yeah. He's okay. Just okay? Guess who just got reinstated? Well, not officially. Nervous? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. I'll see you in there. See, nobody would want their doctor to be that way. Well, I'm good enough. This guy comes up to Jesus, runs up to Jesus in this next story and says, listen, I do all these things, so I'm good enough. Listen to the story. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one's good except God alone. By the way, he was addressing what this man was saying is, I can be good enough. And Jesus looks at him and says, 
Uh, only God can be good enough. In your flesh, you are not good enough. You are messed up. You are broken. And listen, the faster we admit that, the better off we are to realize in my flesh, there is no good thing, just like Paul said, but in my spirit, when the Holy Spirit looks at us and evaluates us. But anyway, he continues. You know the commandments. You should not murder, commit adultery, steal, give false testimony, defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared all these I've kept since I was a boy. I love this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Do you realize that's how God looks at you? Even when you're prideful and arrogant and you think you have your act together and those other people just need to get their act together. By the way, we all have areas of our lives where we're that way. Did you know that? If you don't have any others, just come drive with me. You'll see mine. And then he continues. One thing you lack. He said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his word, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. By the way, there's a little theological argument of whether he means a literal needle or whether he means a pathway, a, a gate that's in Jerusalem. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter. It's difficult. Why? Because we love our stuff. Anything that we love more than God becomes an idol to us. And what Jesus was challenging him with was not his wealth. He wasn't saying, hey, if you love Jesus, you got to sell everything. But he was saying, you can't put things before him. Then Jesus continues, and a little later he says, truly I tell you, no one who's left home. By the way, the disciples say, uh, they go into this whole argument about who's first, and once again, and all that stuff. And he says, truly I tell you, no one who's left home, or brothers, or sisters, mother, or father, children, or fields for me, or the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields. Along, listen to this, along with persecutions. What? And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You know what Jesus is saying? Check your motives. Why do you do what you do? He's talking to the disciples. Do you guys just want to be in charge? You need to understand, if you want to be in charge, you need to be a servant. What? That doesn't make any sense. The kingdom of God is upside down. Why? Because it's about humility. That's why Jesus washed his disciples' feet before he went to the cross. He could have easily done whatever he wanted the night before he went to the cross. And instead, what does he do? He serves his disciples, even the disciple that would betray him. When's the last time you looked in the mirror and said, Holy Spirit, speak to me about my sinful attitudes, about my pride? If you've not been in prayer recently where God convicted you of a sin or showed you an area of arrogance in your life, you might need to spend some more time praying. Because it does not take long. If you're like me, you can be doing great. You just had a quiet time. You're loving Jesus and you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. And finally, you realize in just a second, you went from godly thoughts to ungodly thoughts. And all of us have different struggles. And so allow the Holy Spirit to look in your heart and just like the priest in the temple to cleanse you from all of your sin. And then there's this whole story about James and John, and they basically say they want to be the brain trust of the disciples and be in charge and all that kind of stuff. Jesus talks to them a little bit about being last again. They still don't get it. We still don't get it. And then number three, call out to Jesus. See, here's the deal. This guy that we're getting ready to talk about, there's actually two guys who were crying out to Jesus. We know that from another passage. But since Mark is always trying to make the story very specific... He's telling this story of blind Bartimaeus. See, blind Bartimaeus would have worn an overcoat that also he could put in front of him to collect alms for the poor, for the hurting. And if you were blind, that's the way you earned a living. And to listen to what happens. Then they came to Jericho. By the way, there were two Jerichos. I don't have time to go into that, but there you go. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him. 
He, he was being pushed down. And told him, be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up. On your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his coat aside. He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now think about this. A blind man running through a crowd towards Jesus. What does that look like? Right? Right? Don't you think Jesus would know what was wrong with him at this point? Well, yes. But what happens next? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. Jesus often waits for us to ask for healing. For us to recognize the sin and the depravity and the struggles and the hurts and the hangups, the unforgiveness. By the way, if you have anybody you haven't forgiven, can I tell you what I've had to do before? Lord, I don't want to forgive that person. Would you help me to want to forgive them? Now, that's a prayer. Lord, I, I need help. I don't even want to forgive. Lord, I want to, I want to be mad at them. I want to think of things that I should have said last time I saw them. Lord, would you help me to want to forgive? Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Is there anything holding you back from asking God for healing in your life? You can be a Christian for 50 years and still be self-centered. Still have your eyes on what matters to you. Not care about what other people think or want. Not really love other people because you say, I know how to do it. It's my way or the highway. Or are we able to put those things aside and say, God, you know what? Whatever you want, I'm willing to follow you. Is there any area of your life where you need to be committed to another person? Maybe you've given up on them and maybe it's time to... Be committed. Maybe it's time to look in the mirror and say, what do I need to change? Where do I need to grow? And it could be today that you're here and you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe today as you're here, you, you've come to church or you're watching online and you know about Jesus. You've come to church. You've done spiritual things. But the truth is, you've never looked in the mirror. You've held on to all your stuff. And you're saying, God, I surrender to you, but not everything. Maybe today's the day you say, Jesus, I want to surrender all to you. I don't want to just talk about faith, but I want to surrender to you. Maybe today's the day you do that. I'd love to talk to you about this after this service about what it means. And if you're watching online, you can send me a note and say, Eric, I want to know what it means to be saved. How do I surrender my life to Christ knowing that Jesus died for my sins? And he wants to take my sin. What does that mean? But I know that the great exchange can take place when we surrender to him. He takes our sins and he gives us his righteousness. So that even though in yourself there is no good thing, the Bible says, in him, all good things become possible. He begins to fill you with love and joy and peace. With his spirit so that you can change and become more like him every day. You can't get well until you humbly realize your need to change. My prayer for you is every day you would take some time to let the Holy Spirit hold his mirror up to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the mirror of your word that your Holy Spirit uses, Father, to remind us of what really matters. Lord, as old habits sneak into our lives, even though we are spiritual, even though we've surrendered our lives to you, those old habits of selfishness and self-centeredness sneak in. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us for those times that we're prideful. Lord, forgive us for those times that we've given up too early. Father, forgive us for those times that we've been hurt and we've stopped doing what you've called us to do because somebody hurt us. Help us to walk in forgiveness. Help us to walk in your love. That's only possible through your spirit. So fill us with your spirit. Lord, I pray for that one who's hurting today. They may be walking in fear today that you'd bring healing to their fear through trust. Father, for that one that's walking in anger, that you would bring salve to their anger, that they would know that you look at them and you love them. And Father, I pray too, that we could be those that love each other more and more every day because of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.